Now let's talk about metabolic bone diseases. The first one we need to discuss is osteoporosis. Now osteoporosis is a disease whereby bone mass or bone density is decreased. And it mainly involves the trabecular bone. And remember, that's your spongy bone. The reason why is because it's more metabolically active because there's such a much larger surface area. Now, the most prominent changes you'll see in osteoporosis occur in the dorsal lumbar vertebral bodies. And the reason why is because they're mainly trabecular bone. Now, also, if we look at the femoral neck, right, if we're looking at the femoral neck, we know that we have the head and then we have the neck. This is just a rough drawing. Now, that femoral neck is half trabecular bone, half cortical. Now, because of the significant amount of trabecular bone in the neck of the femur, this is going to be a very um, high risk area for fractures. And if we look at the number one and the number two areas that are fractured in people with osteoporosis, the dorsal lumbar vertebral bodies are number one, and the femoral neck is number two. Now, the major determining factor or major determining risk factor for osteoporotic fractures is going to be bone mass. Okay, now during childhood and during adolescence, bone mass is constantly increasing. So if we were to draw a graph of age versus bone mass, as someone is aging, their bone mass is going to increase, and it peaks anywhere between 20 and 30 years of age. So if we were to compare two people of the same sex and the same background, and we graph them against each other, and we noticed that one of them had a lower maximum bone mass between their 20s and 30s. The main reason why you'll see that is because of genetics. Right? If we compare two, let's say, 25-year-old Hispanic males, and we notice that one had a significantly higher bone mass at the age of 25 than the other, then we can blame that on certain genetic factors. Now, as they age past that prime of 20 to 30, bone mass will constantly lower as they age. Okay. Now, if we compare um, cultural people, cultural backgrounds, um, for example, if we compared African American versus Caucasians, African Americans have greater bone density. And that, again, the role of genetics comes into play. Just like um, Caucasians have a greater bone mass or bone density than the Asian population. Okay, genetic factors play a major role in, um, in bone mass. Okay, so anytime you see genetic var variations in bone mass, always link it to genetics when we're comparing two similar people. Now obviously we know males have significantly greater bone mass than females due to the um, structural differences in the sexes. Now, in order to make a diagnosis of osteoporosis, oftentimes we don't even have a um, reason or a clue that osteoporosis is present until a fracture occurs. Okay, so if we want to make a diagnosis, we do what is known as the DEXA scan. And what the DEXA scan is looking for is the range of standard deviation from normal in the bone mass or the bone density of your patient. So if we have a normal bone density here, what we're looking for are um, jumps in standard deviations. So let's say this is one standard deviation away from normal, below normal. This is two standard deviations. And then this is three standard deviations. Anything that is less than one standard deviation below normal, we say that we have a below average risk for a fracture. Usually that is not anything significant. But once we see a standard deviation rate anywhere from 1 to 2.5 standard deviations below normal, okay, the patient has an above average risk of fracture. 
So any type of patient um, who falls under this category, we want to consider uh, and make we want to consider this to be worrisome, and we want to take preventative measures. Okay, so we want to watch for clinical triggers. Okay, um, this is usually going to be seen in a patient who is peri or postmenopausal. Now, once standard deviations are for between one and two point five, we call this osteopenia. Now, once that bone, that bone mass or bone density is more than 2.5 standard deviations away from normal, we call that osteoporosis. And with this patient, we see a very high risk of fracture. So if this is the case, usually we're going to start them on certain medications. Now, if the patient has no fractures of yet, but they're still at this point, we said that that's osteoporosis. If they're more than 2.5 standard deviations though, plus they've had at least one fragility fa fracture, so for example, hip okay, or the vertebral uh, crush fractures, then we call this established osteoporosis or severe osteoporosis. Okay, remember, we always want to exclude secondary causes, such as some sort of underlying metabolic reason for uh, the decrease in um, density. Okay, but if there's a fracture, we call that severe or established osteoporosis. Now, in order to manage a patient with osteoporosis, the first line drug is bisphosphonates. Bisphosphonates are structural analogs of pyrophosphate, an important component of the bone. Now, bisphosphonates will mimic the structure of pyrophosphate, and subsequently that prevents the activation of certain enzymes that are going to break down the bones. Now, the big picture is that they're going to help prevent excessive bone breakdown or resorption by inducing apoptosis in our bone-destroying enzymes or cells, which are osteoclasts. Okay, so they induce apoptosis in our osteoclasts. Subsequently, that leads to a prevention or at least a slowing of bone breakdown. Now, if we want to eliminate bone pain, a good drug is calcitonin. Now, calcitonin is a hormone in the body that acts opposite of PTH, parathyroid hormone, and it prevents the break for the breakdown of bone, and it's effective for the for treating patients who have bone pain. Now, another effective drug for osteoporosis is the SERMs, the Selective Estrogen Receptor Modulators. Uh, tamoxifen, we also have raloxifene. Now, these drugs are effective because um, at certain tissues, they act as estrogen antagonists, but at certain tissues, they act as agonists. Now, in the breast, these are going to be antagonists, or tamoxifen specifically is an antagonist which is why it's effective at preventing breast cancer. Now, in the uh, endometrium, it's actually an agonist, which is why it can induce cancer at the endometrium. Okay. Now, in the bones, it acts as a agonist. It mimics the effects of estrogen in the bones. Now, what this does is it inhibits osteoclasts. Okay. So, if we talk about it in the bones, we say it's an agonist, acts as estrogen, and that decreases the osteoclastic activity, and that subsequently prevents osteoporosis from precipitating. Okay, so that's how the SERMs are effective. Now, this was originally um, found to be an adverse effect or a, a, a positive, a beneficial side effect in the bones of the use of tamoxifen. So now we actually use them in um, helping patients with osteoporosis. Okay, one of the most important things is dietary modification. We want to keep calcium intake at greater than or equal to 1.5 grams calcium per day.